Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So everyone is sharing where they are joining us today. Seattle, Berlin, Florida, Indianapolis, New York, Canada. Again, we are all over the world. Los Angeles, Switzerland, Brooklyn, Netherlands, I think I missed a few already. And we are in Berlin. <laughs> Hi, Marcos. <laughs> Argentina, Nashville. Great. <clears throat> Morocco, Nigeria, Dallas, Azerbaijan, Belgium, Norway. Great. I think we have at least one representative from each country. <laughs> it's like a World Cup. Hi, Mana. We will start in a few minutes. So prepare your the best design minds because we will a little bit challenge them today with our uh, expert speakers julian and daniel so maybe um we can show the xr pro lecture as well in the meantime, I will show my slides for now. Can you see it? Everything? Good? Yeah, yeah, I can. I can see. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, today is interesting and exciting for us because we will have some uh, exciting announcements. So, um, I hope you will like it. The next era of XR design is starting today with this lecture. So, we would love to see your. Um, participation in the following days. Great. Shall we start? Yeah, of course. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our um, open lecture of April 23. And yeah, um, who has actually already attended one of our open lectures? I think we have a poll, poll, a poll question, poll question about that. Um, maybe uh, you can launch that. Definitely. Perfect. Yeah, I'm. I'm very, very curious to know because this is a slightly different topic than we have before. <laughs> Lots of first timers, that's great. <laughs> awesome, well, while people are voting, I will get started. Um, so yeah, for everyone who's um, first time at us today, uh, we are starting out with a quick introduction about XR Bootcamp and our courses um, before jumping right into our open lecture. So um, yeah, what's actually special about us in XR Bootcamp? And what I like to mention first <laughs> is that we have so many different graduates and um, that after our foundations and prototyping bootcamp, which takes around four months to take, um, you have lots of lots of career opportunities. And um, we love to collect the job titles of our graduates and you can see them here actually. And um, yeah, and they are working at very exciting companies. And uh, yeah, it's um, 
always very cool to see um, where everyone is up to and we're very closely connecting with our alumni network in our private discord server as well. And uh, yeah, there's, for example, three very unique stories I want to highlight from our students. So um, we have Sadiq, who was first um, research assistant at a, at a university in Italy and got a job offer as a spatial engineer at Apple, which he rejected because he wanted to go back to um, actually working in robotics. <laughs> um, then there was Michael, and he um, was software developer before and is now XR prototyper at Meta. And then there was Emma, and she is actually very, very special because she didn't have any kind of coding experience before joining. And she learned it with us, actually with our um, free coding course, which we have before starting the bootcamp. And now she's working as, um, yeah, as technical um, artist at Polyarc. And I think you know that studio, that XR game studio from the game um, Moss VR. And uh, yeah, so that's basically the bootcamp I'm speaking about. Um, we are going to start the next cohort actually very soon in June. And uh, yeah, as just mentioned, um, there is an entrance level exam, uh, which you have to pass. But if you don't have any coding experience, don't worry. There is actually a free C-sharp course, which you can take. And that course actually enables you to pass the entrance level exam. And then once you've passed that, you are basically on to your journey to learn first XR Foundations. So you're going deep into C Sharp, you're going deep into the programming aspects of Unity and C Sharp. Um, and that's very, very important to us because we are really focused on getting you a career in the XR space. And um, and yeah, as, um, as you may know, of course, uh, the more programming you know, um, the better for a career um, perspectives. So that's our four months program. We are, of course, um, supporting all our graduates with career services, um, with one-on-one -on -one career services. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to share the results here. And um, yeah, so, and what is also very special, we usually have industry partner companies. So um, um, uh, big companies, big corporates are joining our students, giving them real briefs. So we will work just like in an XR studio together with other students and work on, on the company's brief. So you can actually like really have um, expand your portfolio and also put a big company uh, name on your portfolio. And that's usually very exciting for Pearson. That was, for, for example, our students worked on um, language apps, on XR language apps, language learning apps. And yeah, you can also check our trust pilot page usually our uh, students are very happy with us and um, we, we really uh, want to keep it that way of course and we are always very proud when we are getting feedback from our students which are happy who are happy and um, yeah so yeah feel free to sign up for the free c sharp course and um, yeah, what's special about us, we are really focused on getting you the portfolio projects you need for your career. Um, I'm also inviting you to join the XR Creators Discord server. Um, uh, maybe you can share the link here in the in the chat. We've already, I think now over 5,000 uh, XR developers, XR creators there. So feel free to ask any kind of question. Feel free to yeah, connect with other people, share events, share meetups, um, share, yeah, share whatever you, you want to share with the uh, with global XR creators. And uh, yeah, we are very proud that lots of companies are actually sending their developers to us. And um, they are actually sending their developers mostly to our advanced level courses. So if you already have experience um, creating XR and want to up upskill more, then there is, for example, a rendering optimization masterclass starting soon. Um, and uh, yeah, we also have other advanced level courses, which you can check out. And um, yeah, and also the advantage here is that when companies send their senior level developers, they're also looking at our junior talent as at our graduates from the XR bootcamp to see maybe if they, um, whenever they need new talent to basically hire new talent from our students. And yeah, we are also very special because we are always handpicking our trainers. So we are always um, looking, our trainers are, are not actually working full time with us. They are always freelancing with us because what we actually want is that everyone is still working on their own projects. So that um, because the XR industry is moving so fast, there are so many new tools, um, so many new techniques uh, launching every day. So and when you have as an XR developer your own project, your own game you want to launch, then you always have to update your own skills. And then you can also teach that and um yeah and and uh, teach that to our students 
so no one is um, learning anything outdated or something from last year. Um, yeah. And uh, what we are just launching today is actually um, a very small month-by-month um, -month program right now, the XR Design Fellowship. Um, and I'm inviting you to check it out um, because what we are usually being asked is, yeah, um, with all with AI, with ChatGPT being launched, with generative AI tools being launched, um, where are we actually going right now? Um, what can I do as a designer? What can I do as a prototyper? And how can I actually um, yeah, be up to date on my skills? And that's why we are going to um, um, invite one expert every month to actually work on a case study together with our um, fellowship members. And um, yeah, and there will also be assignments and mentorships. And if you if you're interested in learning the foundations of XR design, plus also getting real case studies by industry XR um, design industry professional, um, feel free to check out our website and learn more info from that. Um, Ferran, do you want to um, mention anything about this? Otherwise, we can start the. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I, I was just uh, sharing the link of the XR Design Fellowship because this is the maybe uh, part that um, anyone interested may check it out. So um, as you know, as we are mostly doing lots of like a hands-on intensive boot camps and advanced master classes, but this fellowship is probably the most accessible program that we have ever launched so far. Uh, we know that everyone inside that you have some uh, like a design uh, skills or you would like to even expand your design skills. So this is the moment that we would love to even developers to help them to gain uh, their first design skills or designers uh, to even um, even master on XR design skills. We are again proud of our uh, trainers working with us because um, one of them is actually here, uh, Daniel. Uh, we are working with them to, to create the most um, condensed program that you can have in a, in a short period of time uh, possible. Uh, every month you will have different actually lecturers coming and there will be also lots of assignments and case studies attached to this. As Rahan mentioned, things are changing quite fast as we have witnessed in the last few months so um, our program we are pre preparing a, a very nice pathway but it's also a very a never-ending program as well that we will always make you aware of the cutting edge uh, like concepts or patterns or uh, tools that you would want to use as an xr designer uh, and uh, it will be amazing opportunity for everyone to join and it's of course again a very nice cohort opportunity that you will be uh, designing, co collaborating with a uh, round table of experts and with peers as well. So um, yeah, it would be great. Um, Julian, Daniel, do you want to turn on your cameras and introduce yourselves? Yeah, my, cam my camera is locked at the moment. Yeah, so. okay. We are all excited to see you. <laughs> at least, yeah, at least unable can... to start video because the host stopped it. Yeah, maybe you can share screen at least, or we can also share, or Daniel can share screen, at least we can start. Sure, sure, one second. Perfect. But yeah, it's just, I'm still unable to start the video. Yeah, I, I think I'm just sharing my screen and I'm not sure yeah, if the video's we can, we can see the screen now. Okay. Well, Julian, would you like to start? Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to turn on my video, but, but we'll see. We'll, we'll get that to work. Um, <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Julian. Um, currently helping run Bezel, but um, super excited to have you all here today and talk about how to best design and prototype for XR. Um, you know, currently just working on this amazing tool that, you know, I'm building with the team, this collaborative 3D design platform, um, but previously worked at Oculus for about four years or so, where I 
led some engineering efforts around how the panel apps work inside the VR headsets. So if you put on like a meta headset, how all the panel apps kind of float around you and interact with each other and how the uh, components and the buttons kind of can launch your games, you know, all that stuff um, we worked on. And during that time, I worked a lot with designers like Cecilia here, um, and they would use tools like Figma to kind of iterate on the app UI and how the, the panel apps would look and how they would work with each other. And whenever they would bring these designs to meetings, um, managers would ask like, hey, how do I view these designs in the headset? Right, because obviously they're all like 2D rectangular Figma frames. And there are a lot of things around interaction models and you know, panels like popping up closer to your face in VR. Um, and a lot of like 3D uh, movements and interactions that we couldn't really uh, design and prototype. And so the answer to that question would you know, always be, well, we could, but like we would have to partner with a, you know, a Unity developer uh, to like build out a whole interactive prototype, sometimes involves like c -sharp scripting. Um, and you got to export this package to different headsets remotely. Uh, you know, this is also during COVID and, you know, I asked Dennis, our lead prototyper back then, I was like, hey, is there like an easier way to do this? And he's basically like, no, there isn't. Like, this is how the industry works. So we took a step back and then we kind of thought about uh, how many people who, you know, could benefit from an easier tool to really be able to design in 3D and interact with them in XR, in AR, VR as well. So we, we left Oculus about a year and a half ago now. Um, along with Cecilia, uh, to really build this product and take that multi-week process of like, you know, the, the Unity interactive prototype scripting, all that stuff, all into a couple of minutes with, you know, the product we've built in Bezel, because it's simply a website that you can drag and drop Figma assets or 3D assets and hook up some click interactions. And now you just have a browser link that you can share with your teammates and uh, yourself as well. So, yeah, that brings us to Bezel's mission. Uh, we're really just here to empower people to create easy, uh, you know, easy designs and basically these these prototypes that they can share with others, which kind of leads to a, a cross device a spatial computing platform. Um, it is a creation tool that has robust. Uh, 3D features for all types of skill sets, and then uh, really makes use of the power of the web, uh, which is the, the real-time collaboration aspect as well. Um, yeah, and with that, I will hand it off to Daniel, our designer on the team, to go a bit more in depth uh, about Bezel and spatial design. Hey, everyone. So my name is Daniel Marcusi. Um, I was a product designer here in San Francisco for about 10 years, worked at LinkedIn as a design systems designer, worked at agencies as product designers. And about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I decided to quit my job at LinkedIn and just kind of dedicate my entire life to learning the art of extended reality. And it's been really cool. I've taught a lot of classes. I've met a lot of amazing people, have a Discord and YouTube channel that is you know, curating a really cool community. And today I kind of want to express my um, love for XR and the challenges of what, it, of what it takes to actually prototype for XR. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is why is spatial computing important and why does it matter? Well, today, essentially we live in a, two, a 3D world that we consume, all of our time is consumed on 2D panels. And while this has been incredibly powerful for us as a society, it has also you know, severed our physical connection to the physical world. And in that case, we've also had to then sacrifice the form of presence for information. And with the promise of spatial computing from everything from audio to haptics to any kind of visual structure, like. It, we are finally getting back into the world we inhabit. And because of that, we are, as designers, we are no longer designing for a piece of paper or a flat 2D screen. We are now designing for the human body. And because of that, we will have to consider everything from accessibility and what we build and like, and all, 
to basically how we perceive natural affordances and signifiers in our society. And that's going to impact everything from fashion, entertainment, to e-commerce, politics, medicine, you name it. And because of that, designers at this moment are, because we're split in so many different categories where there's a sculptor or a set designer and all these things, we all live as designers in these separate little bubbles. But pretty soon, all of those disciplines will need to come together and unite to actually create impactful design. So, but the problem with any new technology, um, especially designing for it, is that it takes a long time to build and it takes a long time to understand how to use it. And so learning how to prototype these facial experiences is absolutely vital um, for designers or just any engineer for the most part or any creative person to be able to express themselves or to solve problems. Now, as I said before, prototyping is notoriously difficult and has been for a long time. You know, establishing you know, key affordances and signifiers like a pinch to zoom, a tap, all of these things were not given. Today, a lot of people take them for granted, but all of these patterns and all of these ways we, inter like, like we interact with the digital world are brand new. And, you know, and because of that, early tools to be able to actually use these things are like they kind of do an okay job, but they don't really basically hit upon exactly what, what's needed. And back in the day, if we look on our right, this bit, this like video, back in the day when we wanted to prototype stuff, um, we had to draw out all of our screens, go to a tester and then have people tap on paper because we didn't really have the tools or the concepts to actually get people working. And if we, so sorry. And if we look at the so if we look at the flat UX process back in 2013, a lot of this concept from lo-fi to hi-fi design really took place, you know, with paper, Photoshop, Illustrator, and you know, Google Docs. And it was kind of like a waterfall process, and it was really difficult to get the correct assets or really prototype your experiences. But the flat UX design today process of today is a lot more streamlined. You know, you have basically Figma came in and streamlined a web vector-based tool that allows people to participate in real time. And a lot of people may go to other places to do animations and stuff like that. But for the most part, Figma has captured that like audience. And it's been incredibly helpful to get, you know, everyone from advanced designers to junior designers or creators on board. But today, XR um, is still in its infancy. And in many ways, in almost every way, um, it is mirroring the mobile era. And that's because there are no essentially established design patterns for any application. And in order for us to be able to create like a concept in XR, we basically would have to either learn really difficult tools that are very special. We would have to, and uh, we would have to basically, um, in order to find how to do those tools, how to learn those tools, we need to find educational content that doesn't really exist yet. And you have to teach a lot of designers, especially who design in the flat world, how to conceive uh, in the 3D world and understand 3D design theory, ergonomics, and stuff like that. But as I said, it is following um, the mobile era really, really fast. So my design process in 2021 was predominantly, you know, working in Notion with some friends, um, have a fig jam that can, can see things out. I use Procreate because it allowed me to just sketch things, save them on my computer and reference them. And then I used shapes for maybe an hour, maybe 45 minutes to just get the juices flowing. And then after that, it was predominantly Blender, Figma, and Unity. And while I love Unity, you know, it, it is a technical nightmare in many ways and has turned off a lot of designers. Um, and, you know, today my UX process is um, for XR is a little bit different. You know, I predominantly use um, Bezel, obviously, because I work there, but also it's one of the better tools to actually get your ideas out there and, you know, use a solid like foundation for me to build on my computer and test on headset, no load time, you know, but today I still use Figma and I use a lot of Blender. I'm a huge fan of Blender and I then ship it out to Unity to developers. But what I'm hoping is that by in a couple of years, um, we're going to get to a place where a single tool or a couple of tools will be able to handle all of the major things that designer needs, you know, layout, animation, um, you know, like, 
like communication. And, you know, that's what I'm hoping to build here because a lot of, you know, at Bezel, we're a team of eight. So it's a bunch of designers and developers just trying to build the tools that I really wish I had as like a younger designer um, to be able to like this, instead of people worrying about technicality stuff, they can just get into it and start creating as fast as they can. So how are we going to get to a place that is like, how do we get to a tool that is super easy to learn and highly accessible? Um, Daniel, uh, yeah. one, I think you can turn on your camera now. Oh, well, that's exciting. Okay, there you go. Thank you, bud. Um, so we need to make accessible tooling. So what does an accessible spatial design tool look like? Well, right now, a lot of like the majority of people in our society do not have VR headsets and do not want to buy them or wear them for long periods of time. So we need a tool that we need a design tool that is multi-platform. So that means, you know, your grandmother can view your prototype or creation on their phone. You can view it on your computer or on a headset. Um, and because of that, being able to actually launch these things and actually test them out needs to be effortless. So, you know, the concept of just building out a concept. So having to build out a file every time and share it and then download it and go through that rigmarole, you know, that shouldn't exist anymore. It should just be as easy as a snap. Um, and on top of that, we should be able to communicate and collaborate our ideas in synchronous time and asynchronous time. So if I'm on a bus and if I want to basically check out a comp, one of my designers did, I can look at it while I'm on the bus on my phone. So that would be sweet. Another thing is, is that skill net, like we need to be able to create a tool that speaks to a brand new realm of creators and designers. And so we need to have a tool that is basically super drag and drop easy, but also allows, you know, the more dedicated people um, to be able to create what they want in, in very technical ways. Um, and fundamentally tools nowadays need to be interwoven. So being a, we need tools to be able to speak between Blender to, you know, or to Bezel or from Figma to Bezel, everything kind of needs to be interwoven and effortless to use. So how do modern spatial prototype applications stack up today? And, you know, right now, um, the start off, let's talk about desktop. So, you know, desktop right now offers really, really powerful solutions and development tools for people. But like Xcode and Android Studio, um, tools like Unity, ARKit, and Unreal are really focused on development and not design. And I think that is by choice. And also, like, it is their demographic is a highly technical code based world. And, you know, and because of that, and so, and, and on top of that, depending on what device and content you are looking to design out for, it is very difficult to technically tweak them over and over again, or even build them out from um, a desktop application. Um, and again, you need if you really want to get into like the technicality and the high quality um, work, you're going to have to learn some code. Now, let's talk about mobile. So right now, mobile prototyping platforms like Snap or like Spark, um, they are incredible because they allow a lot of creatives to access a tool that allows them to um, experience AR through their phone. And while this is cool, a lot of these tools are like a lot of these prototypes are bound to a specific um, like application. So if I create something in Spark or if I create something in Lens, it has to either lie in Snap or on you know Instagram, and on top of that, like while mo mobile AR is really cool, it really doesn't achieve any immersion or presence. It is essentially a filter, and it is a it just takes a flat rectangular um, sheet, and you know you're able to interact with things that way. Um, and then there is standalone headsets tools. Now, standalone headsets are really, really cool because it allows people to design within their medium. However, like right now, um, the inputs for standalone headsets, like the controller and stuff like that, are very, very primitive and don't allow for, and they're not very robust. And on top of that, um, you know, users are then locked in their headsets to collaborate on concepts, which either isn't accessible, uncomfortable, are just very, you know, time consuming. Um, and a lot of standalone applications also have to deal with store, like app store requirements. And that means, uh, you know, updating or 
making quick fixes to or adding new concepts to their um, tool requires a lot of build submission and time and that is just you know difficult um, and on top of that if i wanted like being able to manage create um, assets in headset are is next to impossible and because of the lack of the computing power of um, contemporary mobile, like standalone headsets, people are quite limited. Um, and that kind of brings us to the concept of hybrid web based, <laughs> hybrid web based prototyping. And I think, the, and this has been um, the best analogy is, is that right now, um, Figma is so incredibly powerful. It, and the reason why it's powerful, because it's wildly um, accessible. You know, you can use, download it, you can use it on your browser, you can download um, the application, which is essentially a web application. And it's just hyper, it's just, it, and it's, that's why it's dominated the market. Um, and because of, and because of um, it's web-based, it can be accessed and used on any platform, which is really cool. And on top of that, like the, the frameworks, and all of like like WebXR and all of these things are open source, and people are constantly um, basically building on top of these things. And the like WebXR in the next, I would say, you know, two to three years will probably be on par with native applications. And so that's super excited. And so with all of that knowledge, we're trying to build an accessible tool at Bezel that takes advantage of AR, of WebXR and the browser. And as Julian said before, we are a platform agnostic um, tool that allows anyone to create um, whatever they want on any device they want. Um, you know, we allow for 3D creation, um, you know, we allow XR prototyping, AR and VR, and it's instantaneous. And we are building it from like the ground up to be as accessible as possible for um, new and experienced users alike. Um, Another thing that you know we take a lot of pride in is that um, Bezel is collaborative. You know, we you can view, comment, um, and share all of this stuff in real time. And instead of having to send over a package or anything, you just simply need to text someone a URL to share your concepts. And as I stated before, um, we are getting more like WebXR and OpenGL, and all of these things are becoming so incredibly. Um, robust and powerful that we're we're getting to the place where we're going to be pacing native. We don't, and we're not limited to app store restrictions or anything like that. And we can utilize third party AI tools that build materials. We can play with occlusion lights and all kinds of stuff like that. And on top of that, every week we're updating something. So our tool is growing more and more powerful every week to empower designers to basically go out there and just put pen to paper and not worry about all the technical details. So on top, so with that said, let's try out Bezel. So if you want, if you're, um, if you want, you can go to bezel.it right now. You know, just type bezel.it into your URL, like into the URL. Um, you can sign up, and then if you go to the gallery, you're gonna see. Oops, you're gonna see this little um, like file here called Bezel Walkthrough 2.0, and just select that file. So I will give a couple minutes for people to do that. Let's share the link. Perfect, Cecilia, thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Yeah. Um, by the way, in the meantime, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A tab. It will be easier for us to manage the questions. <laughs> and so uh, in the chat, it's flowing quickly, so it's hard to follow up, but Q&A is perfect for that. So right now, yeah, keep asking questions. Um, I'm gonna go, I wanna have enough time for um, longer discussions about this. So we're gonna go through the step-by-step -step process in here and just get people kind of, um, you know, accommodated to how this works. And then we can, um, we're gonna prototype something out in headset then we can do Q and A. Um, okay, so um, is hopefully that's enough time to get people inside. Um, 
now this file is a little large, so it's gonna take a little bit of time to load up, should be fine. But um, while that is, while everyone's loading up, um, in front of you right here, we see a bunch of different pedestals. And each one of these pedestals, um, if you're following along, I would like you to build upon them. So right now, like we're gonna go to quick commands and materials and you can just, you know, move from um, pedestal to pedestal to build things on top of. Or you can just play around, you do what you want. So let me, there we go. So we are now in this file, looks pretty rad. Um, now, real quick, so um, enabled to, in order to move around, I have a three button mouse right now. And if I hold down right mouse, I can um, pivot. If I hold down middle mouse button, I can, you know, I can basically um, strife left and right. And, you know, that's, and if I scroll up, of course, you're going to zoom and all of that jazz. Now, if you, at any time, if you want to switch locations um, quickly, instead of having to drag around like this, you just simply need to click these little cameras and like zoom out a little bit. So right now we're going to start with um, quick commands. So um, like any other design tool, um, we need the ability to create some form of assets if it's um, and because we're in a 3D tool, we're going to be using uh, primitives. Now, the way we can create a primitive here is that we can come up to the top left and it goes to objects and we have a box, plane, sphere, cylinder, cone and text or whatever. So if I just select cone, if I um, click, drag and then release and then move my cursor up and then click again, we have a cone. And while that's cool, this could be very um, you know, labor intensive. So we have this thing right now called um, the quick command center or the command center, I should say. So if I wanna add a cone again, I can just type in C, O, N, and then there it is right there. I hit space or enter and I can create it. Now, this is also what we can also do right now. And we're gonna switch between, um, you know, if we wanna basically um, change up, you know, how we're measuring things or like um, our units. Right now I'm in meters, but if I type in millimeters, everything is converted to millimeters. If I type in meters, back to meters. If I type in feet, now everything is in feet, uh, which is really cool. And I'm just gonna go back to meters. Sweet, so now that you kind of understand command center, let's go to materials. So um, what I want you guys to do here is let's create a sphere. And I typed in S or sphere, and I'm going to hit space. And I'm just going to double click on the podium, and it's going to pop up there. Now, you can drag and make it as big as you want with these handles. You can, if you hold down shift while holding these little cubes, you can scale in unison. And like that's really cool. And while this sphere is really pretty and everything, we may want to give it, um, you know, for instance, some kind of um, visual material. And while we could create really cool things uh, like a quill to salmon, a brush material using um, different materials like libraries, um, let's just change this right now to, I don't know, let's click this material with it selected and let's move it from you know, white to red. And then I can change you know, maybe the roughness all the way down so it's essentially um, very smooth and reflective and I can change the metalness, sweet. Now, let's take that, let's actually create a box. So if I type in B, and if I hit space and I double click, I have this box. And let's apply another material to this. Now, this time, instead of it, you know, creating a color, what I what we can do is I can go to this material library here, and I'm just going to apply, I don't know, this wood to it. So now we have this wood material. And if we open up this, this bark material, in here, you can see we have a color map, we have a roughness map, and we have a normal map. And so all of those can be manipulated in any way you want. And um, let's also, with this cube, let's just show off a little bit of beveling. So right now, this is a pretty harsh cube. So we can just change this bevel like to 0.3, whatever you want. And now we have these nice rounded edges. Super cool, super powerful. Now. Julian, are you, um, will you join um, this file so we can um, show up a little bit of collaboration? Julian? 
Oh yes, sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> I was answering some questions on the Q and A side. Oh okay. Um, yes, I'm in the file now. Please so Julian is inside the file. So this next section is all about collaboration, and as we mentioned before, you can basically. Um, build things together, you can comment on things, and Julian and I are actually going to be building something in real time. So Julian, will you um, basically add a, I don't know, just put an object on our podium, and let me see what you make. Maybe it's something, put a dodo or put whatever you want. Mm -hmm. what is that? So while Julian is doing that, if you go up here to the library, if we go into the bezel library, we have a bunch of different assets you can use. Um, while he's adding his, I'm just going to add a duck and bring my duck up. So I have a pretty rad mallard here, just chilling, um, the straight chilling. And, um, and so like Julian can start adding things in real time. Um, but let's say that, um, Julian wants, to, like, let's say if Julian wants to make a comment on this duck saying he wants this duck to change. Um, yeah. One second. How is it not going through? It's okay. We'll figure it out. So, in order so to be able to comment and stuff like that, you just go to this comment tab up here. Um, and I'm just going to, on this duck, I can just say, I want this duck to be this much larger, you know, make it this big. And if I post it, when someone comes into the file, you know, they can either look at it this way, or if they double click on it, it would bring them to that area and it would basically tell them, um, you know, what, the, what they need to edit and what they need to change up, which is super cool. Um, this stuff is like incredibly powerful, especially once we get people start building inside of this together in real time. It's pretty darn sweet. So let's talk about animation. I know this is fast. Everyone, tutorials are coming out. If you have questions, let us know. Join our discords. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to animate something. So um, let's I'm going to go inside of our library and then I'm going to grab this bike. I'm just going to click on here. And I'm going to bring this bike up. Sweet. Now, what I want to do is have this bike move back and forth. And the way that I can do that is with states interactions. So if I click this little states tool right here, I can add a state. And everything starts from base state. So this is where it starts. And so with state one, this is where we want, we want it to end over here. So I'm just going to move it over there. So if I see state one, you know, base state, state one, base state, state one. Cool. Um, then what I can do is like, I can say, I want this to animate on a click, right? So on, I just hit this little, uh, lightning bolt up here for a like interaction. And I'm going to say, um, I'm going to rename this actually. So it's easier to understand. So I'm just going to call it this bike. And then I want my bike on pointer down to go from base state to state one. And then I'm going to add another one. And I'm going to say bike from state one to base state. Now. To do now to preview this, there's a couple of different ways we can do that. If I hit um, play right now, it's going to open up another tab. And if you see up here, um, all of these little areas or bookmarks are you know clickable and navigation like navigable. So like that way, if you have someone coming to your file, you can simply move them around the scene. But right now we're at animation, right? So if I click this bike, it's moving back and forth. Sweet. Now let's say, let's do a little trick real quick. I'm just going to split this right here. And so I have my editor mode right here and I have my play mode right here. So if I want to instance, for instance, like change the material of this, or if I want to like have it. So right now it's just moving, you know, back and forth. I can then, you know, select this. I can add the duration. I can change the duration to one second, and I can see that live in real time. There it is. 
Or if I want to say, um, remove um, a state and then just have this loop, I can go to the spike, I can change its curve to E is elastic or whatever, I can loop it and I can ping pong. So if I do that, we're gonna see, it's just gonna keep on moving back and forth. So this can be very, very powerful um, depending on what you wanna do and how you wanna animate your scene. Cool. So I'm going to leave this. Oh, oops. And let me go back into this full mode. And let's finally talk about um, let's talk about Figma integration and creating panels and stuff like that. So um, right now, um, you can import frames from Figma into like um, into Bezel relatively quickly and easily. Now to do this, you're going to have to connect. Uh, a Figma token for your first time. Um, it's not that difficult. Um, we have tutorials online to show how to do it. And um, let's just build out a panel real quick. So if I minimize this, let me bring up my, um, let me bring up Figma. So right now, um, basically on um, Figma, we have this bezel community. And if I open up Figma, and I choose bezel, of course. I can go into the tutorial section. And right here, we have some lovely panels designed by Cecilia. Um, now, before we, underst you know, before we dive in and export, let's understand why I created this at a specific size. So if I go here, if I open up this area, I have these attention areas. And right now, I'm designing within a 30 by 30 degree area. So that means it's ergonomically um, you know, useful and like easy to actually digest. It's not perfectly designed, but this is the way it's done. And this is the, this is the reason why I did it this way. So if I go to this frame right here, which is panel, which is everything in here, if I right click on this, and if I say copy link, and if I go back to bezel, and if I just hit control V, it's going to paste, give it a second to cook. Sweet. And there it is. So I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to, ro you know, I'm going to rotate it. And then I'm going to do a couple of different things here. I'm going to go to my material. I am then going to change it to unlit. And then I'm going to change the opacity down to like 99, just because there's a little weird bug. So now it looks a lot slicker. And so I'm, what I'm going to do after that is I'm going to grab this little green section right here, and I'm just going to hold down Alt and drag, and that's going to duplicate it. And so I'm then going to go to the material. Oops, I'm going to go down to the material. And then I'm going to remove this. And then I'm just going to create, I'm just going to change the color to you know black. And then I'm just going to move it a little closer to here. Sweet. And so I'm going to grab those two frames, hit control G, and now they are grouped. And let's put in a human so we understand uh, the perspective. So if I type in human, if I hit space, if I click right here, I'm just going to rotate them around with these little handles. Cool. And I can grab these individual frames here and I can just, you know, we can bend them around. Oops. We can bend them around this little dude. My pivot point is off right now. All good. So this gives a general concept of how things can be designed through Figma. And if I, for instance, go into here and if I change anything, let's see if it works. If I go here and if I change this image to, I don't know, let's just you know remove this image and just make it a solid color for now. And it's red. I can also, you know, basically go to this file right now. And if I go into this image, I can say sync updates. And as you see, the updates will sync. And you can see if you have a bunch of different panels or a bunch of different files, um, you can basically um, in your like you can have them all synced within your scene relatively quickly. Now, before I jump into a headset with Julian. Um, what I want to show off here also is probably one of my most favorite things, and that is the ability to switch between augmented and virtual reality quickly. So 
um, right now with, if I select my back, so like my environment, um, I'm just going to turn off show environment right now. We're using an HDRI of a forest, which is very pretty, but we're not going to, we don't care about that now. And our opacity is set to 100, which means we're in virtual reality. So if we switch our opacity to zero, now we're in augmented reality. And this is incredibly powerful because in, in order, like before in Unity, um, using all like MRTK or um, XRI toolkit, like being able to do this is just a, somewhat of a nightmare. And which is what's really cool is that we can switch between them, you know, relatively easily. And you can even create states of like, you can even create states of your environment to toggle on different states or different environments as well. So that is incredibly powerful. Um, Julian, do you have, um, are you connected? Are you in? Yeah. Yeah. I can show now how to visualize and experience that same file, uh, or sorry, um, the same UI panel in a different file. Uh, one second, let me share my screen as well. Um, all right. So I just kind of brought in the, uh, what Daniel built there into just a separate file so we can visualize it easily in headset. And what I will do now is cast my uh, headset so you can see what I'm looking at here. Hopefully that works. All right, that works. Um, one sec. So what we have here is before we go into the headset is just this panel. Um, and I added um, a, like a hidden state and a visible state. And just to preview it just on my laptop first, if, if, if I click on this button, this panel will zoom out. And if I click again, it will fade out. So now I can try that in headset. Um, oops. I'm not trying to play Beat Saber right now. Sorry about <laughs> that. Um, okay, if I go to the browser and then I'm um, just gonna refresh in case it's stale. But yeah, you can simply just open the browser app inside your headset. I'm using the, the Quest 2 right now, uh, but it also works with you know other headsets uh, as well as the Quest Pro. Um, and if I just click on the play button here, just to interact with this file, I will enter the immersive version of this file that I just created. So if I go in here with my controller and then click on this button, we can see the UI panel fade in. And if I click on it again, we see it fade out. Uh, and I also see Daniel with his flamingo is, whoa, that's a bit big. So yeah, let's make that a little smaller, Daniel. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and then, yeah, I can also continue to interact with the, the VR scene that I just um, created as well. Um, Daniel, do you want to try changing the color of some of these spheres or you know, adding something new in the scene so we can maybe see? Sure, sure. I'm going to change of... this sphere here to pink on state one, now it's on green. I'm gonna switch that green to, yeah. um, to, um, to a yellow and that's okay, we'll do that. And then what I'll do also with that big sphere on state two, I will, um, on state one, I'm gonna move it up and then I'm just going to scale it down. So that should change. Yeah, yeah. you can see right now, yeah, it's on, yeah. And right now, is it on auto? Let's we'll say it should be on auto, so it should be growing. Cool. Um, yeah. I can also we have my sweet flamingo here. Um, that's cool. I can even you know, there's a lot of different things. Um, let me see if I can change this size of this. That's cool. Okay. Take maybe needs a refresh a little bit. I think making these sizes have changed has messed up some stuff. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's pretty sweet what I can do. I can. Um, let's just say I want to make my flamingo, you know. Yeah, if you put it down there, it's a little better. Yeah, a little better. Sweet. Anyway, 
the yeah, I'll stop here and I can just exit the file um, with the Oculus button and then go back to my browser to make any edits if I need to. Um, so for example, I could click on the environment color and you know if I want to get a bit darker, um, I can then just enter play mode again. Um, and now I'm in the same file, but a bit darker. Whoa, yeah, that's that's really big. And then, yeah, just interact with the file as usual. Um, yep, I that's about it. Um, pretty easy to kind of visualize what you've built in Bezel just straight on your headset. Um, and if there was a if there was an easy way to stream my phone, I would also show you how to visualize it in mobile AR, but that could maybe, maybe for next time. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we can wrap it up there. So. Yeah, you are not seeing the reactions, but uh, everyone is it's quite like a, in the wow moment of XR design, I guess. So um, for those who have questions, feel free to submit on Q&A tab. I think we have around 25, 30 minutes right now to answer the questions. Thank you for this interesting demo, Bezel team. I think um, I think the link you shared, Julian, that we can already, uh, in VR, we can try, right? The link that you yeah. shared. Yeah. So I just shared a, a link that, you know, if you're on your computer, you could just click on the menu button here to just trigger it, fade in, fade out, um, to check it out. But if, if you also have a headset nearby, you could also pop that on and uh, check it out yourself in the browser. And you should be able to basically interact with the same thing with the controller buttons. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, great. I mean, uh, shall we start the questions? I think there are quite a bit of questions right now. Let's try to answer some of them at least for today. Yeah, we got a lot of questions. We'll spend some time to go over them. Um, I already answered a good number of them, I think, um, in the Q&A chats. Yeah, but... maybe maybe you can just uh, wrap it up in terms of like uh, basic questions that you have answered if you would like to verbally share here as well. Yeah, let me stop sharing. All right. Let's go to Q and A. Yeah. Um, let's see. What's something we could we could easily talk about? So. Yeah. So I'm getting some questions around like how do we export a bezel file into something like Unity? Yeah. Right now, what we currently support is you know you can export bezel objects or scenes as a GLTF. Uh, you, you can access it. In the, the top left menu and go to um, file and export as well. Um, we, that unfortunately won't have all the animation and the interaction data that we currently use inside Bezel. Uh, but you know, in the future, we do plan on having a more integrated export process so that you can take what you've created in Bezel and then use it in a production game engine like Unity or Unreal. Um, but that's that that's part of the, the roadmap. Um, let's see. Great. So um, let's quickly go through the questions. So um, in terms of cross-platform, uh, you are already answering that, but anything you would like to tell about your plans about the cross-platform support or collaboration support, cross-platform collaboration support? Daniel, do you want to take this on? Yeah, yeah. So the, the question, so when looking at Stuart's question, which is a good question, and it says, does Unity remain the best cross platform for production? And I would say at the moment, yes. Um, Unity at the moment, like they're putting a lot of their resources into full on production of the XR space. So I think that that is great um, for cross platform stuff for us. We are aiming to basically. Um, you know, if we're saying it matters how you define cross platform, if it's like mobile, if it's broad, where it's like mobile desktop headset, 
we we do all of that right now um the creation space with it like right now um predominantly to create like when people create things it's predominantly on the desktop but that is going to be changing at some point um but yeah um, hopefully that answers Stuart's question at the moment um it's notoriously difficult in unity right now to build um ar experiences and stuff like that um so why so the next question is why is asset management difficult can you expand on the challenges um i would say that okay so when you so assets inherently are difficult because um you have to understand um their poly count you have to optimize them based on you know their poly their try or poly count and you have to understand to optimize their materials you have to you know be able to manage them and move them between spaces relatively easily. Um, and doing that on a standalone headset is just, it's next to it. Well, first of all, it's technically, and I don't even think it's like, it has enough power to be able to do that. And it's just really, really difficult to manage assets within there. You are also like um, kind of stuck to primitive controllers to be able to access these things. Um, and asset management especially is difficult um, because, you know, be, to be able to you know like understand what file can go into what and being able to understand like how it can be like how you can you know pack different things uh, assets creation and management especially for any kind of designer um it, in xr is incredibly important so if you want to get into this field um, you have to learn a little bit of 3d um is bezel um accessible for people with disabilities I mean, I don't think that we're fully ADA compliant. Julian, do you know? Yeah, we we, we add um, standard accessibility uh, tags and features inside the product. But I mean, I will say, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more work we need to do to, to capture the different abilities. Okay. Um, next question. Um, Sorry, these, I love all you guys have all these questions. It makes me very happy. Um, can I design something in Bezel then export to Unity? We are working on that. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds of specifically how we want to do it, but it is a common desire people want and where we are listening. Julian is replying to that one. Um, I'm currently studying UX at a university level. How do you see applications like Bezel entering the learning space for UX? Um, I think any, I think that essentially any accessible design tool like Bezel, um, I see, you know, I think that it will enter it, enter into the educational platform, basically um, on either partnerships with universities and our, and our tool, but a lot of people are just finding it now and just using it. And because it is the easiest tool for people to actually get their concepts out there. And so I think you'll just see people naturally gravitate towards these kind of tools because it is just like, you know, people don't like you do, as a designer, you should not be spending, you know, an eternity trying to debug unity to get something working. If you have an idea in your head, you need to get it down to paper as fast as possible. Um, can we build an APK, an APK for the app lab? Are you, um, is, so yeah. Bezel is currently not um, able to like ship out APKs because we, you know, we don't have like compilation system or like a way for you to put out a whole build. Uh, what we do is we have a browser link that you can actually publish to share with different people through the browser. So in that sense, it is a way for you to share your 3D work with other people without having to go through like an Oculus store or even the app lab. Um, but yeah, we don't do like APKs with Bezel. Um, what are the other output, oh, people keep on. What are the other output formats and platforms supported like Android, iOS, and want to know if I, um, want to know if that it has support for mobile um, VR and Google Cardboard SDK. Um, I mean, the output format as we like for this specifically is just the web browser um, on basically on Android, um, you know, the like Meta's headsets are automatically, um, they already have, it's all built on Android and there's Chrome support. So um, everything could just be um, painlessly um, brought through a browser like that on iOS at the moment, there are, there are applications and like, um, 
I guess, like browsers that support WebXR. I have a feeling, I mean, Apple has been very stringent with how they open up WebKit. So that's become an issue, but I have a feeling in a couple of months, um, WebXR is going to be um, available on Android as well. Um, on what platform is Bezel built on? Is it Babylon, 3JS, or a other or another tool? Julian? Uh, we use 3JS, and um, we also have sort of in-house custom um, shading materials and uh, languages we use on top of uh, WebGL. Okay. Um, another question. This is a, a point of view. For, it's not really a question. It's a statement. Uh, if you're a hiring manager, if your designer wanted to work in XR and is unfamiliar with Unity, Unreal, is unlikely you'll be competitive hire. Um, you do need at least basic familiar how these game engines work to um, publish worlds in XR. I would say that's pro that's kind of true right now. I think that um, I I I see that right now everyone is super lean, so people want to get people into. Uh, Unreal and Unity, and I think that if you're really want to take this seriously, like I think concepting your stuff out in Bezel is really sweet, but then moving into those realms of Unity is very, very important. And we're not really, a, I wouldn't say we're a competitor with um, Unity or, or any of these other tools. It's just simply like um, you know the same way uh, you know Figma is not a competitor with um, you know Xcode, right? Um, so like at that point, like, yeah, if you want to like designers today may need to know a little bit of unity, but right now, if you, especially if you look at the industry, um, if you go to meta, if you go to all these places that are hiring little to no one understands unity. And so they have to basically have a prototyper that fills the gaps. So yeah. I don't necessarily, and I don't know how many designers, like right now, if all these designers knew how to use Unity and Unreal and all the stuff. That's great, but design, but you know, there's more work. You know, I don't think a lot of these companies are going to turn down work um, or are really great designers just because they don't know a highly technical game engine. Yeah, I mean, I like the question of this. Yeah, go ahead. Of, yeah, go ahead, I, 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 I think our belief is that the the general air of your industry just doesn't have a good design tool specifically meant for product designers. Because right now, when we think about product designers, we think about, oh, designers for basically 2D rectangles, right? You know, we're thinking of websites, we're thinking of mobile apps, um, and we're not dropping them into Xcode or Android Studio to build out full-on production builds. We're dropping them into Figma, right? So I think if you look at the, the air of your industry um, moving forward, Unity and Unreal for sure, like they're great tools to build out production experiences and games, you know, because they are primarily game engines, not uh, with the purpose of being a design tool for designers. And, you know, I, I believe that Bezel is the, the best design tool out there for, for people to, you know, get their hands dirty with AR, VR, and 3D in general. Uh, I, I, I completely agree with you as well, Jim. I think uh, this is a very a nice interesting comment on that side that uh, when you look at the, all the XR roles out there we when we analyze of course the ones requiring game engine skills are majority by far but again as Daniel mentioned uh, this doesn't mean that um, best designers are out there and then they cannot find opportunities it's all about how you can actually combine your skills with uh, game engine skills and become a, uh, one of the top designers. And from uh, like from the opposite direction, actually, when you look at developers, if they don't have at least enough design skills or not having prototyping mindset, I think uh, if you don't have this kind of superpower, it's um, it's not a good fit for for uh, companies as, as well. So uh, try to combine all these skills together. Uh, we. Up to now, we haven't created any design program uh, till today. So actually, the design program we are building uh, with Daniel and other experts is actu actually ad exactly addressing to this uh, gap in the uh, market right now. If you're a developer, you can start learning about XR design in this program, 
continuously. And if you are um, already a designer, you can master your skills uh, with all these uh, new paradigms. Now, we I think there's one question about pass-through. I think uh, a new paradigm of design, XR design is opening up. We are seeing quite interesting apps and Bezel is also supporting that. So we have to somehow keep up with the, with the new um, features coming from XR, uh, XR platforms. And Apple device, we haven't seen yet. Maybe at least most of us haven't seen yet, right? So uh, I'm pretty sure it will be also interesting for designers to play around with the new um, expectations from the Apple device. So uh, definitely the, the, the question is, I think, uh, yes, some unity skills needed, but definitely we need more um, skillful designers on the market right now. Perfect. Um, this emissivity, is there anyone who would like to answer this question? Or maybe Jay? Have you checked out, have you checked out our physical materials? I'm not exactly sure which we don't have we, we yeah. don't have a miss we don't have miss a miss of materials we've been playing with it we're still working on it because like we want to make sure that it works properly and it, you know there's like like a mission is especially is a little bit difficult but it will get there at some point um I have tried bezel before but always use shapes XR to prototype um or did things directly in unity this looks more powerful I think it's pretty it's getting it's getting more and more powerful every week um and that's what's also really exciting um i thought it was um is it okay what kind of applications are these example prototypes of um oh i mean like the yeah, prototypes that laugh, like, like yeah like if you try on uh i think the one that daniel tried to show and what i tried to show at the end was like example like os menu app for headsets and like that, that's something a lot of designers, whether you're building like a VR game, uh, you know, you often need like UI that lives in 3D. That that was yeah. an example. I mean, I mean, essentially everyone's going to be trying to take the 2D world that we have and bringing it into 3D. I mean, I mean, and we can, that's a deeper philosophical discussion, like design philosophical discussion. But yeah, I mean, it's basically, you know, how do you like, there's, there's not like, it's just about showing you what the tools can do in this prototype. It isn't necessarily trying to create world, real world applications. So we, it's maybe that's a, that's a good note for next time. Um, is it possible to import animations from Blender? I'm not going to say too much right now, but hopefully soon. <laughs> um, exciting updates. Yeah. Exciting I'm updates. Excited. I'm very excited about that update whenever yeah. that happens. Um, this functionality is awesome and e uh, and way easy. I would definitely use it for work. However, my company requires very strict. Yeah, uh, requires very strict. Yeah, I mean, so we, yeah, we're we're still working to like um, make the the product like fully security compliant with all those uh, abbreviated uh, uh, licenses out there. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a work in progress. I'm happy to like chat in person. Uh, just email me at julian at bezel .it and, and we can better sort of list out our security protocols today. Um, is the training in XR free? I think that's a, a Farhan question. Um, it is actually, as I as I mentioned, I mean, we have all these open lectures, but this program is quite hands on. So it's uh, basically, uh, as you may have seen from the website, it's $50 early adopters uh, access, accessing uh, possibility right now. So monthly, it's like a monthly payment and every month you will have access to another module. So this is how we are making it quite accessible for everyone. Um, feel free to uh, at least sign up and uh, join on the waiting list. We are hoping to launch the program uh, this summer and I, I and i have taught at schools before and i think this long drip method is the most realistic way to learn a new tool versus just trying to cram it and i think that this is i think it's cool um will figma files also import interactivity uh, from those files to static slates um not at the moment there is um, Figma's um, API is, from what I understand, very, very limited. Um, but I'm not a developer. Um, but right so, now, it's we're going, go on, Jules. 
Uh, yeah, right now, um, we don't um, communicate with Figma's interactions and their prototyping abilities right now, but uh, we, we do plan on having some, you know, better improvements there. So coming soon again. Um, I want to create a synth VR app and trigger MIDI. Um, could this be done in your software somehow? I'm assuming MIDI sounds and stuff like that. It is on our, it's on one of our very long lists of things um, to do is add sounds and files like that. Yeah, audio effects, uh, sound effects. They're so important, yeah. yeah. If you remove the environment and test um, this mode in Quest 2, will you get, will, will you see the pass through like in like AR? You will see pass through, you will see, I mean, in Quest 2, you're yeah. gonna get that grainy, you, you, we're gonna, you can get that grainy gray thing, but you'll be able to do that. Yeah, I'll share the, I'll, I'll share the instructions in chat right now. Um, after prototyping bezel, do we need to export the scene into Unity to develop it? Uh, can we model 3D assets from scratch on bezel and add motion capture uh, and FX, um, VFX, et cetera? Um, I mean, at this moment, you can export your, your content as um, GLB files. We do not have any of that uh, motion capture um, FX or VFX, um, but it is on. <laughs> The roadmap, uh, yeah, we're, we're. I think our tools have been out for like officially like four months, so we're just yeah. we're, we're marching. Uh, yeah, I think um, right now, yeah, we, we have a lot of uh, features coming in in the future, but right now, a lot of the workflows we see are you know people can still model three D assets using a tool like Blender, which is pretty common out there, um, and then easily like drag and drop an FBX or GLB or OBJ just into a bezel file, uh, and then we can sort of play with the materials there, like add interactions or kind of integrate it with a holistic scene that you can share with different people online. But that's all part of, of, um, of the process today. And you know, in, in the future, we will be able to support more um, modeling and more U UI design inside Bezel um, and, and so on. Can you code interactions between objects inside of Bezel or do you need to take them to Unity in order to do this? I mean, if you mean like, if you say coding interactions, I, I'm assuming like there's no code right now in Bezel, so like you can you can have it, like things trigger other things in Bezel, um, yeah. and when we do offer export um, functionality, um, we'll try to bring that in. And you know that's also there's a lot of like there's a lot of technical things with that that we have to consider. Yeah. Um, can you make changes within the virtual environment like Shapes XR, or do you need to edit in the browser window? Um, right now, at the moment, everything is done in browser. You could theoretically, I've done it before, I have my, um, you, can, you can basically use your mouse and keyboard within your VR headset and edit in the editor window and then switch back and forth between the builds. But at the moment, there is no live. Um, again, that's on our short list of um, things to add. Um, what are some of the VR projects being built in Bezel right now? Yeah, so we can have um, a lot of designers at the AR VR companies or um, gaming companies or you know, even at architecture firms using Bezel. A lot of them are internal, so we can't really just showcase them publicly. Um, but we do have some showcases on the gallery side or you know, even on our website that you can also check out. Yes, they're pretty substantial companies too. But um, how long is the beta version available? Is this yeah. a TBD? Yeah, it's TBD. Uh, you know, as you noted, uh, Bezel, Bezel is currently in beta, um, uh, totally free for all to use. Um, at some point, we will get out of beta and then release a sort of a subscription plan and all that stuff in the future. Um, audio files, we answered that one. Um, is it possible to prototype sliders? You can prototype sliders, direct touch, or any of that stuff at the moment isn't available, but within a short, like we are working on something that will answer a lot of those things. Um, so we have 10 minutes. Uh, let's speed it up a little bit. I just want to make sure that we cover as many questions as possible, maybe some of them. <laughs> Julian, you can also answer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, 
yeah, what are the next big updates for Bezel? I think you'll be seeing a lot more exciting updates around the, the creation side because, you know, the creation tools inside Bezel are, you know, not as expressive or powerful as like what Blender supports or what Figma supports uh, for a lot of these apps that's coming into Blender files or the Bezel files. So yeah, we'll, we'll be pushing a lot there. And then we have a very exciting update uh, coming over the next several weeks or so that will change, blow your minds on how interactions and states will work on Bezel as well. Uh, specifically for Daniel. Uh, was the 30 degree something you were talking about design panel process? Was there, where can we learn about this at the moment? Um, there's not many places. I would say check out um, Google Daydream. They do stuff on all of that stuff. Um, like they do a, they have a speech from 2017. You can also join, if you join my Discord, like XR Design, um, you can, I have a bunch of learning resources you can use um, to find that stuff. Yeah. Mozilla Spokes. Not sure what Mozilla Spokes is. Let me look it up. Oh, um, yeah, it, it looks like a 3D social scene for Mozilla Hubs. Yeah, I mean, so if it works with different standard like 3D file formats, um, then you should be able to integrate with Bezel pretty easily. Import FBX and other formats. Yes, you can import FBX, GLB, yeah. and OBJ, maybe. Um, yeah. Um, the real-time collaborating aspect is neat. How do you envision this change to how immersive content is created in the near future? I mean, I, I, I these are all very deep questions. I, I, I would, um, it's something that we can take offline if you want to join my Discord and we can talk about that. I, I think that um, real-time collaboration and getting um, things in front of people to actually add to is a human thing. And I think that, um, especially when it's our physical reality, um, being able to do that in real time with people is important. Uh, one, one maybe uh, tease about the program. We actually have a module directly for this that we are, we were talking with Daniel. Uh, actually, it will be part of the fellowship modules. It's quite a, a extensive topic. So I guess we definitely need one module for that. It's a very extensive talk, though, yeah. Especially cross-platform as well, you know? So if uh, everyone is from the different device, I think it's the future of design anyway. So we would love to share it more with you. Yeah. I think uh, one thing I'll note on the real-time collaboration is, you know, growing up on Google Docs, you know, replacing Microsoft Word for a lot of my text productivity and also seeing tools like Figma uh, replace sort of the local on-prem design tools. Um, you know, I, I think it's unavoidable that over time, the general 3D design workflow also goes to the web and becomes centered around real-time collaborative workflows for teams to easily collaborate. I mean, sharing a browser link is just so easy compared to having to compile something and, you know, to, to the previous point about APKs and like sharing that file in Google Drive and Dropbox and then downloading it and having the other person have the same app with the same version, all these things, right? So it will happen. And I think in the future, this is how all immersive content uh, will be designed. Um, I'm just kind of going through to see if there's any pot shop questions because we basically have a little- Yeah, we won't be able to answer all of them. Uh, but yeah, so are there plans for AR anchoring? Yes, we are working on that. And that is a very difficult problem. But yes, it is. And it's a very fun problem to work on as a designer. But yes, we are working on that. Um, is there a set prices on subscription? No, we have not this, We have not gone through that yet. Um, it's a, yeah, it's all free. For, for there's you. always going to be a free version, so don't worry. Um, yeah. Are there partners, uh, particular skills you recommend aspiring XR developers to develop to support senior designers like yourself? Learn, learn, 3D, learn 3D tools, learn, like do audits, understand um basic um patterns and do that just through audits um can we add 3d sounds we went over that um is is there a polygon limit there's not a polygon limit but you, we are working on something to give you an accurate health check of your program um you don't want to bring in the thing of like a billion i would probably um on headset standalone um oculus suggests no less no more than fifty thousand polys i would say 
you know, keep that down to 30 to 50,000. So like if you bring in an object that's 50,000, you just spent your allowance there. So just be very clear, be, be very careful. Um, is there a polygon limit for, okay, we went that. Um, can we, can we do coding ourselves or can we just design? Um, I mean, I think that's a question for you too. It is like, you know, if you're a designer, uh, you're probably not focused on coding all the time. Um, and I, I think Bezel is a, is essentially a no code tool that allows you to do things that currently with other tools it involve a lot of code. So that's the, that's the way I would frame it. What are the um, a good question? What are the current limitations today that you will help be solved in the near future? I think anchoring is a big one. I think physical presence, um, XR rigs are a big one. Just open APIs that will handle all of these very technical things. Um, we're going to see that come out of these major corporations like Apple and stuff like that. And so um, whenever they can just streamline that process, I think that's difficult. Another difficult limitation is that you have a lot of people have to conceive of how to design in 3D space, which is also going to be part a module. Um, so um, inside of the inside of the school. So I would say that the biggest limitations is how you can see reality and the technical tools needed. Um, do you believe every current website has to be designed into a VR accessible web page? No, I don't think you have to have every every current. Um, do you believe every current web page has to be designed into a virtual accessible web page? I mean, I would imagine at some point it should be. You should think about accessibility for all of those things. That's a longer discussion. Um, yeah. What are what are good place? What's a good place to learn about XR design principles? Um, pretty soon the school, but there's a lot of good stuff on YouTube. Um, if you join again, uh, my discord, uh, we have a lot of resources and stuff there. It's just about finding the community. It's very, very early. So it's hard. Um, um, someone asked, can you do bezel? I, so you can do bezel AR and VR passer, but is there also a way, um, or have plans for smartphone AR? We, yeah, right now we support smartphone AR. Um, so that already exists. Um, yeah. Um, people are asking, yeah, we're, we have two minutes. Yeah, I think we can wrap up here actually. Um, okay. we'll just share, sorry for not going over, uh, every question, but we have a documentation page that, you know, I've been linking this whole time, uh, you can, uh, it slash docs, you, you can go there to answer most of your questions around the product, whether it can do something or cannot, uh, if you don't see it there, um, yeah, we're, we're still working on it. Um, you, you can follow us on the Discord channel, which I think a lot of you already joined. Uh, so thank you all for that as well. Uh, we'll be, we'll be posting regular updates. We are working hard to like improve the product every single week and you'll see something change every week and, you know, improve your workflow for AR VR designs. So that's, that's super exciting. Th thanks again, uh, everyone for joining us, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank, you. Thank you, Farhan. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I would love to really uh, tell you that the reactions in the chat was quite powerful and interesting. Uh, I think everyone loves what they see today, both the Bezel product itself and the lecture. So uh, thanks. Thank you guys for your time today. I'm really looking forward to start the fellowship program as well with you guys and with other experts. Um, I just launched also one uh, poll just to understand how much the demand in terms of the fellowship, because uh, it will definitely help our experts to um, maybe uh, even encourage themselves to, to even commit further to this program. Uh, for those who haven't seen the fellowship programs website, I'm also sharing again with you. So um, I also see a few questions. What are the best XR apps or games that has good design principles that you are asking? Uh, it is the exact thing that we would love to actually explore in the fellowship program. Every module, we will have one game or app that we will make a UX breakdown. And then we will actually teach based on a real industry world example and go deep dive on uh, on different parts of these design patterns, principles. So we would love to see this community in the fellowship program this summer. And uh, our open lectures will continue in the next um, uh, following weeks as well. So uh, continue 
following Bezel, cognitive following XR Bootcamp, and uh, also our Discord servers we shared. So we would love to continue the conversation and the, um, all these discussions in, uh, asynchronously on Discord. And thanks for joining today again, Daniel, Julian, all the Bezel team, Cecilia on the chat. So everyone, uh, thanks for joining today. Have a very nice rest, rest of the week. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye.